Hello, this is another episode of Music in Mind with Anthony Calkins, and today's episode is a conversation with Alma Cook, who is a singer-songwriter based in Los Angeles, working primarily in pop and R&B music with a strong 90s vibe, and she's also the owner of an oil and gas compliance company based in North Dakota, so she spends a lot of her time going back and forth. And uh, Alma and I have an interesting conversation about the economics of music, the politics of music, current events, philosophy, libertarianism, free speech, and all of the things that kind of go along with those topics. Also, I have some new music out. It is a short album, which is available on Spotify or Amazon Music or iTunes or wherever you stream your music. It's called Hiding, and it is a three-part piece of music that explores the idea of hiding in various ways. Before we get to this episode, please remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channels. And if you would like to support my content generally, please consider visiting my Patreon page. Welcome to Music in Mind. Music in Mind. Hi. Hi, Anthony. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, so this is Alma Cook. She is a musician, songwriter, recording artist, and uh, she travels and tours, or was, for a long time. Pre, uh, for a while, pre- yeah. It's been a little minute now. But. Pre-COVID. <laughs> so how, uh, how are things going with you in terms of music these days? Oh my gosh, it's such a complicated question, Anthony, yeah. <laughs> and it's complicated for no reason. <laughs> like, like I, I have such a f- strange, um, tangled relationship with music, and I, I can like barely explain why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, I think that I'll sounds try. like a sounds like you're a good musician. It's a good answer. Yeah, I don't know though. Like, it's a little bit different than the normal kind of like weird musician relationship. Um, I. So I, I'm a very contrarian person. If Good. <laughs> the whole room of people believes one thing or is like doing one thing, then I don't want to be doing that thing. Mm-hmm. And given that I live in LA where everybody is doing the music thing or the acting thing, oh my God. It, it immediately makes me want to run away and just like do other stuff that's yeah. not music, which is, it's kind of a bizarre, it's a, it's a b- bizarre reaction. And then another thing that kind of uh, complicates it, especially lately, um, is I I run a company on the side, and oh, okay. I really really love it. And so I actually have a day job that I'm obsessed with and love. And so between those two things, I actually feel like I've kind of been sort of shirking my responsibilities musically, and maybe not <laughs> stepping into the fullness okay. <laughs> of like what I could be doing musically. So it's, yeah. it's a hard it's hard to explain what I've been up to. Like there just honestly has not been much in the last year or so. Right. Um, that I've either released or but I've, everyone's like, when's the last time you played a live show? And I'm like, God, I don't know. It's been a minute. Has it? Um, and that's kind of the reason why. It's okay. this weird personality quirk and then the the uh, the day job thing. Right. But I'm pretty content with it at the same time. So um, what what is the company? Mm. So I work in oil and gas. <laughs> oh. I own a compliance company in oil and gas. So if you were like a welder... And uh-huh. you wanted to work for Exxon. Exxon is like, I don't know who you are, Anthony. I've never heard of you. Like, prove to me that you're not going to, like, get one of your employees killed on the job. And so they right. make you jump through, like, a bunch of different hoops. But okay. um, you grew up on a farm or something. And so, that like, you don't know how to do paperwork and computer stuff. And so I'm the one who comes in and helps you um, navigate that. And so and I, I love it. It's a lot of problem solving. Mm-hmm. It's It could not be more different from music. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a nice palate cleanser. <laughs> Interesting. Guess. Does it influence yeah, music at all, it or is it completely mm-hmm. separate for you? It does. In fact, um, I actually had a song that I wrote about the oil field. I promise it wasn't as, as corny as it sounds. It was supposed <laughs> to come out in June. And I actually shot a music video where I featured a bunch of my clients. Um, but then, I mean, a lot of things were going on in June, and people were not trying to hear about, like, country problems <laughs> at that time. So, yeah, so, yeah it, was and a it weird, got put on the back burner. To release music, I, I finished uh, a project around June also, and I kind of like, hesitated. You? Yeah, I was hesitating for a while, and I just released it a couple weeks ago. But it was like this. Oh my gosh! Did you? Congratulations! Like, yeah, thanks. It was fun, but yeah, for sure. Tell me about that. Like, what made you finally pull the trigger and decide that it was? Um, time? I mean, I was just sitting on it, and I thought, 
uh, well, I wanted to try playing it, and I, I'd booked a show in, in Madison, Wisconsin, but then COVID cases spiked again. Of course, yeah. And uh, so it seemed kind of irresponsible to be trying to do all these live shows. Um, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, if you could even find a venue that would have yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But um, so I was, I was hoping to get to try it out, um, and I was going to try and coordinate the release with that but that kind of fell through yeah, so, so I, I thought i might so as well just do, be out there of course so did you try like a, a big online marketing push then instead or what I'm did you re- kind of do to compensate <laughs> <laughs> see that's I'm where not, that, that's, that's exactly the face that i make <laughs> it's exactly yeah. the face what are you doing for marketing uh <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> I, i'm i'm bad at that and i shouldn't be and i don't know i'm better with i'm better at marketing the podcast but i also I also have this thing where I don't like putting a lot of money into something that I don't feel like is making much money. And so I end up at, in, this, in this cycle yeah. of not not putting enough money in to get any return because I feel like I'm 100%. not going to get the return yeah. anyway. I know. I mean, it takes a lot of capital to actually get right. a return on any. I mean, that's just like mm-hmm. a principle of business. So many businesses die just because they don't have um, a, a big enough injection of capital. But it's- Oh, I think we are for Rosen. Oh, you're frozen on my end, but I can hear you. Yeah. There you are. <laughs> All right, we're back. Sorry, what were you saying about capital? Oh, um, yeah, no, it just, it takes a lot of, it's, uh, so many businesses die just because they don't have enough capital infused into them, yeah. but you're right, like, it's so hard to know where to put it. Mm-hmm. There's so many different streams. Yeah. Um, you could, you could go the Instagram route, you could go the Spotify uh, playlist route right. and go ham mm-hmm. on playlists, um, ads. You know, like, who actually knows where to put the money? And if you don't yeah. have that much to play with, really, what good is it going to do? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Have you tried, um, have you worked with Submit Hub ever? Mm-mm. I don't know what that is. Submit, oh my gosh, Anthony. Oh my gosh, you <laughs> must know Submit Hub. <laughs> Granted, it's much It's much better for pop music. I haven't heard okay. your record, so I don't know exactly what uh, no. lane you're in. No, noisy. But Submit Hub is the greatest invention okay. for like indie musicians who are trying to get on blogs and playlists. Okay. And it's essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a hub where all of these bloggers and Spotify playlisters and even Instagram influencers, people like that, anyone with a platform Uh um, congregates and it does cost money. Well, there's actually free credits as well, but um, to get a good amount out of it, you'll pay like a dollar per submission or something Mm -hmm. and they have to listen to it or else you get your credit refunded. So it's a really good way to get around that problem of people just not opening your emails. You can yeah. filter by genre. You can filter by how many uh, people they tend to approve uh-huh. for submissions, uh, it, how many followers they have on their whatever. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, it's for music to be added to playlists and things like that. The the most that I've gotten out of it has been from playlists. Okay. But there are blogs, there are um, some like pretty legit publications on there as well. A lot mm. of them are uh, affiliated. Not all of them, but many of them are affiliated with Hype Machine. Hype Machine, okay. right? Hype Machine is like the the prestigious mm-hmm. music blog network where if you're on like a Hype Machine blog, mm-hmm. then you're more likely to to pick up even right. more traction. So it's a way to get around. I mean, even even as I'm saying this, I'm like, ugh, like what a terrible game. <laughs> this whole thing is just a game. I know. I'm music just marketing. so daunted by this entire yeah. idea. Oh my god, it's terrible. It's terrible. No, like self-respecting person should have to <laughs> go through this. You just but become it, so it, self-obsessed it's very, too. Like very streamlined. I know. I know. Yeah. Just like the the self obsession of the the entire like marketing mindset for uh, for an independent musician because you spend so much time crafting uh, these profiles for yourself and editing your own work. Where I feel like if if you have a team, it kind of helps distribute that a little bit. But for but sure, the, just like the amount of time I spend looking at and like thinking about like logos and websites and I know blah 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 blah, blah all of it. I know it's it's such a waste and it it feels like you're just looking in the mirror over and over and over and then you realize <laughs> it's been a week and I haven't written a song. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah, it takes so much um, time. Yeah, but so, I I know. I know I know. But submit up is a is a really good way to get uh-huh. around that and at least minimize the time expenditure. It does cost some money, like I said, but I mean, for every release I have, I'll throw a few hundred bucks at submit hub uh-huh. and I've gotten cool. some pretty good results. I mean, my my Spotify is not like the most pop in place in the world, but I've got like a few 
tens of thousands of plays off of yeah. Submit Hub. It's pretty good. So you should definitely check it out. There's a lot of rejections. You get so many rejections. Good. I'm, that's which fine. just comes with the territory. But at I, least I they've listened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. You get used to it. Yeah. You get yeah, used rejections to it. are good. Who? Uh, I think it was in my, my uh, undergraduate, one of the composition professors was saying that... Um, she was talking about somebody who would paste them all in their on their bathroom wall. Every rejection they got. That's their such a good idea. Yes. <laughs> well, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of them if you submit good. through Submit Hub. <laughs> good. I love it. So it's my emails. favorite. It's my favorite kind of email. <laughs> we regret I really to don't inform mind. you. <laughs> I really don't mind, Anthony. It, and it's one of those things. Like the more I like my own music, the more I legitimately mm-hmm. don't care. And with every passing year, I like my music even more. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm getting better at it. I'm yep. getting the production quality up. And I'm really proud of what I'm doing. So that, it really doesn't matter if someone doesn't like it. They don't like it. It's fine. Yeah, that that's awesome. I, I like that you say that you like your own music, too. Do you ever listen to it? All the time. Good. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> I, I had a, a composition lesson once with a, a, a David Cope, who's a professor at UC Santa Cruz. Or he was. And uh, he asked us before he listened to anybody's music, who listened to their own music? And everybody, you know, very humbly didn't raise their hand and no, no, no. You're supposed to say no, yeah. Right. And then he said, well, then why would I want to listen to any of your music? Why would I want to? If yeah. you don't even No, like exactly. It. <laughs> it's, it's such a good point. And we just feel, maybe that's the contrarian in me, because everyone else feels like they're not supposed to say it. When I'm like, well, I'll just go ahead and raise my hand there. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I do en- I enjoy my own stuff. I enjoy my team and I, I like celebrating their work and I like celebrating mm-hmm. when my voice sounds good on something. You know, yep. I don't always think my voice sounds good, but when I do, I'll, sure, I'll tune it up. Um, the thing is, though, if I get too self-absorbed in that way, I don't know if self-absorbed is the word, but too like inwardly focused, then I don't have enough like fodder to... Mm-hmm create new material it really is listening to other people's music yep. that inspires me to, to make new stuff I, and i every time i listen to a new album i'm like why am i not listening to a new album every day because yep. i get so inspired just mm-hmm. from turning on a new record it could be even a bad record but maybe there's one or two <laughs> songs on there that had a certain like hi-hat sound that was yep. just exactly cool. what i would want in a mm-hmm. future track that's cool that's very production uh minded so I, I I was listening yeah. to some of your it's music <laughs> on, uh, on on Amazon Music. I think that's my go-to instead of Spotify. I don't know why, but really, yeah, you're the only person I know who's ever been like, yeah, let's get, find me on Amazon Music. I totally listen <laughs> there. <laughs> well, I think I, I think I saw on on uh, Distro Kid that uh, that you make like point oh oh two cents or point oh oh two dollars rather than point oh oh one so it's like all right wow (laughs) what a (laughs) per stream riches you are just basking in riches oh yeah yeah um but yeah i mean the the i was going to ask you about the production work is that something you do yourself no hell no yeah so i'm i'm big into specialization i really like people who are gifted and have worked very very hard in their specific area Mm -hmm. to be doing their specific thing um oftentimes when you tell people that you're a singer the first thing they'll ask you is oh like what 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 do you play and i'm like "Mm, (laughs) i'm a singer (laughs) i don't really play anything i mean i I can toy around on piano i could toy around on actually right here i have a a tenor guitar which has just four strings like a ukulele and so i tune it like a ukulele and i I can kind of cheat it that way but i'm not a tenor guitar player like are are you kidding me (laughs) i don't i can make you know i could make a beat every now and then and i do have i do have songs where Mm -hmm. i was the one who made the skeleton the first draft but i'm not going to be the person who puts the the finishing touch on any kind of production i I trust uh, my best friend who's an incredible world-class bass player he plays for megan trainer and uh, Isley Brothers, he's Whoa, super like, cool. yeah, he's out there, he's doing his thing. So I trust him, I trust his musical ear and his his production ear a little bit more. And then my vocal engineer is a pop producer, mm-hmm. and so he's got like the 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 magic touch with any kind of programmed beat that we need to to okay. add or cool. things that we need to change. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a team effort. It depends on the song, and but increasingly as I get older, I'm just like I don't want to waste any time trying to do stuff that I'm not the best at. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 is tough. I think I think you're you're definitely on the right track with the the distribution of specialties. 
Yeah, do you do that as well with your stuff, or how does that work? I, no, I, when I picture I, you making music, Anthony, I know nothing about you, <laughs> but <laughs> but when I picture you making music, I imagine you alone in your room, just like doing your thing <laughs> and killing it. And well, playing around with that. different sounds. Definitely, definitely. Uh, <laughs> I try and do too many things and things I'm not good at. And I had to give up. I was trying to do visual programming to go along with a lot of my mm. music for YouTube videos and stuff. And like cool interactive algorithms. But like I'm terrible. What does that even it. mean? Like those things on Microsoft, like QuickTime or whatever. <laughs> where like, <laughs> Well, the problem is like I'm a... not good enough at it. So it looks like that. It looks like a screensaver. Ah, it's, it's like lame. fireworks. Yeah. With, yeah, screensaver. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, huh. I, I had one that I liked, but then I kept, I was using it for everything, so I needed something else. But uh, so it just correct me if I'm wrong. What it does is it plays off of what's happening in the frequencies in the audio. Yeah, right. And so, it creates a visual that mm-hmm. responds to yep. that. Yeah. Huh. That's super interesting. It's it's sorry. It's my awesome. I don't know if you can hear that beeping. My no, it's room fine. Is turning up our treadmill. <laughs> it's uh, it's awesome if you're good at it, and there's like amazing uh, interactive visual. Uh, programmers and stuff like that but i am not one of them huh so then what's an area where you do tend to farm out specialties uh i think that would be an area that i should i feel like i haven't really gotten into that farming out specialties i feel like i i have a do-it-myself attitude which is sort of good and bad in its own ways like i sort of like the kind of crafting everything myself and tinkering Mm -hmm. and the solitariness, but then also I feel like it defeats a little bit of the purpose of music making to me, Mm. which is a very... Yeah. I mean, to me, what I like about music making is connecting with other people. Yeah, 100%. Uh, That's what makes this time so confusing and disorienting for people is all the normal options we have for not even collaboration and like a like a traditional sense, but just even playing, mm-hmm. <laughs> just playing with other people. Yeah, They're not available. It's so, yeah. so tough for people. I mean, music even seems a little weird at the moment. And like, Tell me what you mean by that. Well, I guess with how disconnected people are, it almost feels like music doesn't make sense. And I feel like there isn't a whole lot of demand for for music and it's something i've been thinking about with the with the protests and all the civil unrest going on because when i think of other political movements i have kind of a soundtrack that goes with them Mm. and i think about like this the 60s political movements and all the protest folk songs and rock songs and woodstock and all that and there's like a very strong musical aspect to this political force and I don't really feel anything like that today, with with as strong as the political movements today are. Right. No, that's a super interesting point. I think Chloe Valdry has actually talked about that a little bit mm. as well as how this this particular movement doesn't seem to have a lot of artistic bent. Yep. Um, I mean, I've seen a few pieces. Do you, do you listen to Anderson Pack? Mm, uh, no. I know the Anderson name. Anderson Pack. It's funny to call him a rapper, and it's funnier to call him a singer because he's not really either of those things. But he's an uh-huh. artist. He is a remarkable, remarkable artist who just has a freaking amazing team of musicians. And he put out a song, um, probably mid June, called "Lockdown," mm-hmm. and it's it's kind of a time capsule actually for what's going on. And I, yeah, it's probably the only thing that I've really seen that that uh try to draw out musically what's going on and make a sort of anthem Uh it's very much like an anthem for the people like it it talks about being downtown during the the demonstrations oh wow but yeah but it's not like anybody is holding hands and singing that together i I, i'm watching this um i'm watching eyes on the prize the pbs series about the civil rights movement right now and it is so musical. Yeah. It is so musical. You're right. I mean, there people would gather, they would sing. And I don't know if COVID is a limiting factor on that currently. Because Maybe. even people in churches are not supposed to be singing right now. But you're right. It's 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 a very strange time for music. Yeah. I mean I I have I have suspicions that the music industry is partially to blame for that and sort of intellectual property and copyright laws have been building and Mm. i think that those are factors in our relationship to music and so it makes 
the idea of communal music more difficult, maybe. Oh, interesting. But I'm not. So you feel like I mean, the I'm whole... not sure. It's just an idea. Oh yeah, no, it, it's an interesting theory. I don't even know. I don't know what levers it would be pulling to get that result. Exactly. Yeah. It's hard to imagine, but it is such an intricate system. There's so many moving parts. So I could totally see you being right. Yeah, I don't know. And social media, maybe, maybe mm-hmm. social media has played a role as well. We're we're all very much more in bubbles, and we consume music. You know, we're, we're streaming it. Mm-hmm. We're we're queuing up a playlist. I don't really think of it as a communal thing ever anymore. Right. The, I think of it first of all being a recording art rather than mm-hmm. a like a live performance art. Right. Maybe that's just my COVID bias. <laughs> I've forgotten what a no, concert I, looks like. No, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, it's weird. So, yeah, just weird things that I'm struggling with about what what is the what is music doing for society at the moment and what is its function. What would you like to see it doing? I don't know. I mean, I was having a conversation about flamenco music the other day, and it was kind of interesting to think about it because I see it as as a true folk tradition in that it isn't commercial music. And a lot of it is unattributed in terms of authorship. Mm. But it's also highly virtuosic. And that's an interesting combination. Tell me what you mean by virtuosic. I don't know that word. Um, So if I think about certain types of folk music where basically anybody can play it and anybody can sing it, uh, it doesn't matter how good or bad you are, so to speak. The idea hmm. is the, the performance of the music, and the idea is not the accuracy of the performance. So is that a cultural expectation that's projected onto music, or is that you know, intrinsic to the way the melody is and how singable it is? I don't know. I mean, I think you can probably complicate any singable melody as much as you want. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, I mean, pro- singability is huge. Especially if you listen to like Woody Guthrie tunes from the 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 forties and fifties, like Dust Bowl songs and stuff like that, they all kind of have the same melody and the same three chords, and they're all hmm. like super singable. And basically, anybody could just be like humming one while on the dusty trail to California or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Um, so. I mean, I don't know if you're saying that that kind of music is necessarily superior or better. No, I, don't, I don't know not. where philosophically you are, because you're you create a lot of new music, right? right? New mm-hmm. music being like the I don't even know how to describe it. The, the more abstract, the kind of oh, the, you mean the like new art. music? <laughs> yeah, 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 that, yeah that that's word. what I mean. Quote unquote new music, <laughs> oh, like the I equivalent hate that of whatever. Um, I know it's terrible. I mean, but classical music is not really <laughs> it's descriptive even worse, either. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it maybe is. it's not worse. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of people who would say that, quote-unquote, new music, uh, or even modern jazz, Mm -hmm. to some degree, is inferior because it's not singable. And then there are people who would Mm -hmm. argue the other way around. Like On the flip side, they would say, well, you know, it's so singable, it's so simple, the simplicity makes it somehow worse. So I don't know if that's (laughs) even a, a... I feel like you don't even yeah, fall anywhere I don't, on that spectrum. Thing, you kind of let music silly. be music. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's interesting to, to look back, to look certainly at the effects, how right. um, a singable melody can really unite people. I mean, that's what people Definitely. are doing in church, right? Yep. They're, mm-hmm. they're uniting one another. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man, I, I had an interesting experience playing uh, a couple church gigs this this last month, like COVID-style church gigs. Where, no kidding. What did that look like? Were you doing it from home or were you with a small group? I was with a band and we were in a really big open room with masks. And then the <laughs> the congregation was in their cars in the parking lot. You're kidding. It's like a drive-in church service. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. And, and it was being piped <laughs> into their crazy. cars. So no communal singing oh, at all. Gosh. And then it, that Whoa. also felt weird. It was like, what are we doing here? They could that's just play so depressing. A song. Oh my gosh, that's so depressing. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. But was that, that in Madison or was that in California? Uh, no, that was in Yorba Linda, California. Yorba Linda. It's uh, like huh. North Orange County. Yeah. I've never heard of anything like that. <laughs> it was so weird. That's the kind of thing that should be making the news, but it's so common now that there's just these weird, you know, ways we're improvising life. Yeah. 
So, so what about you? So, as a recording artist and working primarily, at least at the moment, through online releases, how how do you feel the connection and the communalness through your music? Oh man, I this is where I just really feel like I've been shirking my responsibility as an artist because I moved to LA and started pursuing the arts because I liked it, the power of music to start conversations. That was always yep. my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, in avoiding social media and getting exhausted of the marketing stuff and not wanting to throw myself in people's faces and loving to be a contrarian who just, if you ask me what I do, I won't even tell you about music. I'll tell you about oil and gas because I know you've never heard yep. a chick talk <laughs> about that before. Um, I have been avoiding conversations about music, around music, through music. Uh-huh. Uh Um, it's the first thing people ask me about when I go home and it's the last thing that I want to be talking about. And I don't really know why it's tough. So in COVID, COVID has kind of just given me more of an excuse to retreat. I feel, I mean, I I was asked to do a few Instagram live streams where I would, Mm -hmm. you know, sing acoustically and Mm -hmm. this coffee shop or whatever would go live. And I said, no, (laughs) I said no. Like yeah. I just turned down the opportunity. I mean, first of all, it's super lame. Like a live stream. <laughs> I'm so tired of these. Like, how sick are we of seeing the little notification pop up and be like, Anthony Hopkins is going live? It's so I, I'm over it. There's nothing. There's nothing rich or conversation about that experience. Everybody but watches for 16 seconds. I know, and then they just dip. Yep. <laughs> they just dip. Uh, but yeah, like even the opportunities I've had within COVID, I feel to really start recording more or do more collaborations. Um, I, I have been doing some session vocals right. still, but I, I've by no means kicked into high gear as a result of COVID. If anything, COVID has driven me to, number one, be super obsessed with the news. I started yes. getting the Wall Street Journal in print. I spent like two hours Whoa. reading it every day. <laughs> I, know. I mean, that's, that's great. You're not looking at a screen. Yeah, no, it's so much better. I'm not as, as distractible. And then two, I'm just super deep into Twitter, and uh-huh. I feel like I'm I'm kind of pursuing this weird, this, like half musical, half intellectual lane. And right now, I'm yeah. really emphasizing the the intellectual side of it more. And that's I yeah. think like if there's mm-hmm. one thing to come out of COVID for me and my music career, it's that I really really want to see these two parts of me merge the part yes. of me that's interested in thoughts and ideas and the part of me that's creating they don't always yeah, have to be I'm, overlapping i'm not i'm not gonna write every song about you know like uh, objectivism or ayn rand or like something like that <laughs> but i i you do should. want Everyone. to yeah every single one <laughs> just be, have it be my trope because that's super annoying but what i what i want to see what I want to see happening is the people in the intellectual space mm-hmm. start inviting more artists into their midst yes. mm-hmm. um and not dumb artists that are just, you know, listing off philosophical ideas in a rap song or whatever, but oh. very, like, skillful, thoughtful mm-hmm. artists that know what they're doing. Uh, and then I want to see artists step into the intellectual space a little bit more themselves. And, yep. you know, not in like a... There's this trope now about how every celebrity has to weigh in on every crisis, right? And that's not the way uh, in which I mean. But for artists to really just pick up a book... <laughs> And have a have a real conversation, not yeah. a euphemistic conversation that's not a conversation about whatever's happening and, and see where it falls. Because they have a different perspective. They have a different yep. perspective than the people in the ivory tower. And mm-hmm. there needs to be more cross-pollination. Yeah, I, I think it's it's difficult for me because I, I feel very comfortable, comfortable in academic spaces. Um, but mm-hmm. at the same time, I... I always find it very difficult to talk about music. And I think that extends into other spaces. So I think you, you mentioned to to me the other day that you were interested in trying to write words, essays, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I'd love to break into that world. And I've also been doing I've been writing essays. I haven't been submitting them to anybody. But just to try and get my brain into into that space... Because I feel mm-hmm. like I do that with my music, but I don't know how to talk about things other than music in a careful or academic way. Maybe that's interesting. First of all, I think you're wrong. I probably <laughs> just even knowing what I know about you, I feel like you're much better at it than you might think. 
But yeah, no, that, it's an interesting move, and there's nothing like writing to really help galvanize your really, thinking on an sure. issue, whether mm-hmm. or not you publish it anywhere. I think you should be submitting it places, and I, I plan on helping you do that. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I think that there's a hunger for it. I think there's a yeah. hunger for the mm-hmm. artists to start moving in that direction, and for the... Um, there's certainly a need, if not a hunger, for the intellectual people to start uh, crossing over into art, artistic like spaces. engaging in I don't art know what themselves. It would look like. mm-hmm. I mean, I yeah. feel I feel but like again, a lot like, of the ugh, the people that that we've been a, following are engaging in art, also like Chloe some Valdry, of them are John very, McWhorter. Yeah, John, so John McWhorter. He's a jazz pianist, right? Uh, Chloe, yeah, I I don't know actually what his capabilities are as far as like artistic expression. I know he loves music, and if you I listen to his podcast, which is about linguistics, regularly. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I wouldn't at all be surprised. In fact, I'm I'm sure that he has some kind of musical um, training because yeah. uh, the way he listens to and digests the music that he talks about is very musiciany. Yep. Yeah. But he's still. I don't know. Like he, he's not entrenched in the space. Yes, like he's true. definitely sitting in in one world, and it's not the musical world. Yeah. So then you know how it feels when an intellectual person talks about music, and I and I'm I'm not looking for more people <laughs> to be talking about music. Yeah. I'm looking them looking for them to invite the artists in. Like like news, and newspaper actually, columns and went on music, and they have their resident yes, ethnomusicologist exactly. to say something <laughs> exactly. stupid about pop tunes. One hundred percent. Yeah, but Chloe Valdry is an interesting one because she's actually making it, right. um, and producing, and and her whole intellectual shtick is actually pulling from the arts and culture mm-hmm. to draw out lessons and to find common ground with people, which I think is completely novel and completely needed. Mm-hmm. So, do you feel like music and or art should? I guess where do you feel like music? has a place in these conversations that are happening, uh, say, in, like, the heterodox movement or something like that. Sure. Well, I think we're still figuring it out. Right. Right? But one thing that I would like to see more of is some lyrical diversity. <laughs> I, I'm i actually... I'm, I'm publishing a paper on this pretty oh, cool. soon on my blog, hopefully, where I analyzed the top 100 songs on Billboard for the last 15 years or however long they've been wow. keeping track. I Big think it's project. 20, 2006. Yeah. So I, I parsed the lyrics uh-huh. and I developed a little, uh, a little system that would um, b- basically assign points for different categories of, of topics. So a song is mostly about sex or love mm-hmm. if it includes these five phrases, or not five, but <laughs> like 50 phrases sure. that sure, commonly sure, sure. crop up. Uh, or it's mostly a personal flex if it has these five brags in it. Or, you know, and then there's Good. the partying <laughs> sphere. And, and that's and those three things are what mm-hmm. 99% of, of pop yep. music is right now. It's, it's love and sex, mm-hmm. it's partying, and then it's personal flex and bragging. So, did you so, come up with those three categories? I did, and it's really hard to break them down because the lines are so hazy. Right. Well, lo- really love hazy. and sex as being one category is an interesting choice. It is interesting. It's I thought about separating uh-huh. them. It's really, really tough to do, though. It's sure. super tough to do. Right. Well, because I, I feel like a lot of songs exist in sort of a hybrid space. Mm-hmm. And of course, like, uh, why wouldn't they? Right. Yes. Those things yes. are so intertwined. Mm-hmm. But then you end up with, you also end up with the, the personal flex songs that are like, yeah, I have, you know, these five amazing cars and I also have all these women. <laughs> and so they'll talk about women for a long time. And right. it's not really about love or sex. It's about right. themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, yeah, that's it, an interesting... it's been fascinating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's been super, super interesting to pick apart uh, the lyrical content. And I'm... I'm not the person who wants to do like affirmative action for like political songs or something. Like, like I don't need to see five or ten percent of the songs on top forty radio be about politics or like, Man, heterodox the, thinking. That's the, not what the, I'm like, asking for. Ob- obsession <laughs> with percentage representation is ridiculous. <laughs> Actually, I wrote an essay about that a couple of weeks ago. About like, did you? Just what a weird world that creates being a uh, yeah being obsessed with making sure that your percentages line up. Yeah, it's very strange. It's it's kind of akin to dieting, I feel like. Uh-huh. Like when you're thinking really, really hard about how you're eating and like your macronutrients and your micros. <laughs> like what a terrible way to live. You don't eat you don't eat carbs and proteins and fats. You're eating 
you're eating bread and butter right. and avocados and salads and like those those are what give the world color it's mm -hmm. not those macros and micros yep. so it's, it's a strange way to break it down and i and i recognize that even as i'm analyzing the top 40 songs i'm falling into the ivory tower intellectual trap of <laughs> like trying to turn this into a science when it's yeah. literally an art <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but i would like to see that being said a more care taken to um to talk about things that are more than just about breakups mm -hmm. and new relationships and partying. I, I think there's a lot of value in, I don't know, it's, it's like spilling out even in prose form what you might be feeling about current events or some hard conversation you just had with your friend or whatever and converting that into an, a musical piece. Right. I, I don't know what it looks like. Like I said, I think we're still figuring it out. But there's yeah. so much room. There's so much room for exploration here, and nobody's really paying attention to it. It's true. I struggle a little bit um, with where what I think the function of music is in communication. Because, you know, there's all those mm. tropes like music is a language, music is communication. And it's like, not really. I wouldn't really... Not really. I wouldn't give yeah. a, a weather report in music. Uh Nobody would understand what that's I was true. talking about. Mm -hmm. so that's really well said. If uh, if I'm trying to, if I'm really trying to make a point clearly, I'll probably use words like prose, an essay or something mm -hmm. like that, rather than music. And I see music as being sort of the the feelings side of it, or or at least very feelings heavy. And it's uh, it's actually a criticism mm -hmm. I have of Hamilton, the musical. Uh, is it's so expositional and there's like three songs that deal with internal emotions and i think that those are really powerful but like the whole history of opera is there's all the recitative which is kind of telling the story blah 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 blah, blah. but it's mm -hmm. really about the arias it's about the internal and that's where the music is magical and the music is powerful and so i struggle a yeah, little bit so with the function of music in an intellectual space anyway not that not that they don't yeah not that they aren't in communication with each other yeah i, I agree 100 percent. and this is a challenge that i think anyone who's politically centrist or politically right has mm -hmm. uh like because the the narrative of somebody on the left there's this wonderful book by arnold Kling called the three languages of politics and it talks about how the progressive narrative is one of oppressed versus oppressor right um, the the libertarian narrative is freedom versus coercion, mm -hmm. and the conservative narrative is um, is civilization versus barbarism, and one of those is mm. much easier to write a song about than the other two. Okay, <laughs> it's the one that involves people, you know, because yeah. you, you a, an oppressor has a face, an oppressed person has a face, whereas civilization versus barbarism, like like what even is that? Like that like, sounds cold hearted and and kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Freedom versus coercion. I don't know that anyone <laughs> really high understands yeah. the value. It's it's very highfalutin, exactly. But an oppressed person, so, that's the blues. Yes, that's the blues. It's the freaking blues. Yeah. So they they already have, they uh, I, I don't say they pejoratively, but the left already has an upper hand <laughs> in that area. They. And if, if the right or center or anyone in this heterodox space wants to start talking about, about their lenses in their music, they have, they have to be very, very lyrically gifted to pull that off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just harder to do, yeah. right? Um, but like you said, I, it's interesting that you said if you wanted to make a point clearly, you would probably use words. But mm -hmm. I would say if you want to make a point deeply, yep. you have to use the arts. Because mm -hmm. yeah, that that's where true. you feel it. Like it it's, it's feels petty to even say you're feeling it. You're embodying it. You know, sure. the bass yeah, is pumping yeah. through your body. You you're inclined to move. Mm -hmm. It's mobilizing, you know, in a, in a mm -hmm. unique way. So these, this is all stuff that's been staring about. And I don't know where I'm going to land on it. I don't know that I have to land anywhere in particular, but it's certainly fun to think about. Yeah. Uh, so uh, do you want to write about music, too, in, in that way? Because it's interesting, the, the, the essay you're talking about seems sort of like data-driven and statistical analysis. Well, that, yeah, I wouldn't even call that an essay. I'd call it more of a paper. Okay. I would call it a white paper, but that sounds, I mean, I'm not a sociologist, uh, right. so I don't know what I'm doing. But I do want to publish that as a data set. I see. And yeah, then yeah. draw on it for other essays. For example, mm, I want to write sense. the essay um, about what I just talked about, how mm -hmm. the left is always going to have an upper hand in, in the arts. Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's, it's an why. interesting point. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it is interesting. 
It is interesting. You should read that book, and then I feel like you would really enjoy the Arnold. What's claim. it called? Three languages. Three languages of politics. Okay. Yeah. I've been I've been going yeah, back to so old, old stuff lately. I, I just read. It's, uh, it's ama- yeah, this has been a time of reading for everybody. Yeah, you just read what? Yeah, so much reading. The it's, it's short. It's like sixty pages. The Anatomy of the State. Murray mm. Rothbard. I just wanted to. Murray Rothbard. Yeah. Yeah, the Libertarian King. I was at. <laughs> uh, I actually played music at uh, Mises University one year. So the Mises Institute. Oh, I'm not wow. sure if you're familiar. Yep, this group yeah, in Alabama. Know. A yep. think tank, libertarian think tank. Yep. And I was invited because I'm uh, friendly with Bob Murphy. Okay. Who, I don't know if you know his show, but he's he's got, he did this show do called I... Contra Krugman for a while. and. Whoa, maybe I do. Does he have yeah, a podcast? Yeah, Tom Winston. He does, but Bob Murphy has his own show now. Okay. <laughs> but what happened was I, I came at him on Twitter and I was like, you guys, you're just so abrasive. <laughs> like, could you not be so <laughs> abrasive? I love the concept of your show, but you're turning people off who actually could stand to learn something about economics um, through these Krugman yeah, columns that sure. you're picking apart. And of course, they're not going to change the tone of their show. It's whatever. But but he took it to heart and we became <laughs> friends. And so he invited me to Mises University Great. or me, the Mises cool. Institute where Mises they host yeah, the right. summer program called Mises University mm-hmm. for young. It's mostly young people. So mm-hmm. I got to play music at some of their events there. And um, I bring this up because you mentioned Murray Rothbard and they had mm-hmm. the library, like the personal book collection of was it Rothbard or was it? Uh, yeah, it was Rothbard. That Rothbard's right. personal book collection. So you would you would pick up these books, and he would have little inscriptions in the <gasps> That's margins. That's amazing. He was That's a so super snarky guy. Yeah. That's great. No, you would have loved it. It's a super super cool. Yeah, place I like to I like his writing a lot. Explore. Mises is tough. I have a hard time with his writing. I actually haven't read like the Libertarian Founding Fathers. <sighs> He's very uh, thoroughly. It, I've read it reads really harshly today because. Everything is man, and when when man does his blah 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 blah, and so just from from a modern perspective, I'm like, oh, make it a little more broad, yeah, buddy. Wins. <laughs> right, <laughs> and the contrarian in me doesn't care. I'm just like, whatever. Like the yeah, feminists well, will be yeah, backlash against I, this. I also don't I'm, like I'm gonna, the. I'm gonna soak uh, it up. <laughs> yeah, I I don't like how it's this weird thing I hear I see in a lot of libertarian writers is this belief that people are so separate from nature. Mm. Oh, that's a super interesting point, Anthony. Which uh, I just see people as nature, and I actually don't like the distinction of natural and unnatural as hinging on humans. Yeah. And even like a city so tell me what, seems like the most natural. It's just our version of an anthill or something. Yeah, it's emergent order, yeah. right? It's emergent order the same way a bird's nest or an anthill would be. So what do you think would change in libertarian thinking if they were to concede that point? The, that's a good question. I had not considered that question. You're just being nitpicky for no reason. I have the, I, no, actually, that is my biggest problem is I'm always nitpicky. Uh, I I zero in on just a little thing and I get hung up on it and I don't even have oh, a why. It. It's just like I don't. I, I just it. go. I, I don't it. agree. I don't like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? That makes arms no sense. Arms folded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's what, easy to what, be what, what a, an change? armchair critic. I don't Certainly know what is. would change. Is there yeah, anything I mean, hinging whole... on it? I don't think that there is, Anthony. I don't know. I mean, I guess if if we wanted to go uh, like extend principles of liberty to animal rights or something I, I could see someone making an argument yeah there but i mean i can see in certain cases if i mean maybe with with religious argumentation or certain types of argumentation that hold humans as a special category as being mm-hmm. more important but i don't even think you need a religious argument for that i mean there's just sort of like the personal well-being or you like you take care of your own group before the others or something like that yeah i don't know yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. You should think about that. Come back to me. Invite me on next <laughs> time we can duke it out over Mises. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh man, it's long. It's long and uh, dense. What, what am I reading? Hu- For sure. Human action. Human action. That's right. Do you read much Adam Smith? Uh, I don't think I have yet. Okay, Adam Smith is wonderful. Mm-hmm. So he, I don't even primarily think of him as an as an economist, even though he mm-hmm. is. Right technically i think on paper the founder of economics he's more of a moral philosopher Mm -hmm. and um podcaster russ roberts and author russ roberts who is my favorite economist personally 
is really, really good at um, teasing out what's what's uh, worth knowing about Adam Smith. He's got these little nuggets of wisdom, mm-hmm. and Russ just extrapolates on them so elegantly. I love it. Um, he's actually got a book, I've, I have it on my shelf, it's autographed by Russ Roberts, called Adam Smith oh, nice. Can Change Your Life. And he takes these little segments of Adam Smith's writing mm-hmm. and writes little paragraphs on them. It's, it's, um, it's a cool. neat way to consume this yeah. great thinker's work in a more modern way. I'm a big fan. That's good. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so what else? Do you, do you have anything coming out or any plans for any musical work, uh, anything like that coming out soon? Yeah, well, I, uh, I've been sitting on an album that's 90% done for okay. like a year and a half. <laughs> wow. Whoa. And I'm a terrible person. I'm You're a, terrible, a terrible, person. terrible person. I just I need I need to be comping these vocals, and it's really just, it's coming down to that. I need to comp the vocals, select my takes, and get it mixed. Yeah. Because that's really the only thing standing between me and the finished product. But for whatever reason, I can't get off my butt and actually do it. And in the meantime, I'm writing other stuff. <laughs> and so oh, like yeah. I, I have and then a you new move song. On, right. Yeah. And then I move on. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think maybe mentally I've already checked out or something. But it's a good record. Uh-huh. It's a really good record. And I need to put it out. It's uh, it's live instrumentation. Some of, some of my best work, if not my best work. But I've just lost the, mm-hmm. the momentum for it. So right now I'm actually working on a song called Bobby that I kicked over to my best friend producer a few days ago. Um, just to kind of like subsidize his living now that the unemployment <laughs> is potentially yeah, we'll see. <laughs> compromised <Yeah. laughs> so i'm like hey here's something to pay your rent <laughs> for the month um that'll be good we'll see where it goes mm-hmm. I, I think it'll come out but i've just been releasing singles yeah and yeah i, I noticed that you, that you had a you had a few or was it last 2018 mm-hmm. maybe or two, last year did you have a couple i don't know where everything is let's see I released Courtship last year and So that was Close. Last year, yeah. So Close is probably my favorite thing. Oh, I was going to, I really liked So Close. It has such a, a cool, like, 90s thing going on. It's 90s, it's so, right? It's yeah. It's so much fun. I was hearing, like, TLC and maybe, like, Spice Girls. Mm-hmm. And it was great. It's, <laughs> I never thought that I'd be uh, compared to Spice Girls. But not in a bad way but at all. I, I love it. I'll take it. No, not in a bad way at all. I'm, I'm really, really pleased with that song. It's. Yeah, it's probably my best work. My phone is not loading right now, but I, I can't name my own songs off the top of my head. Well, I, yeah, I was listening <laughs> to So Close and then Courtship. And actually, the, the guitar work on the acoustic version of Queen is so good. Is that you? You know, it's f- no, that's um, so that's Chris. That's okay. my bassist. Producer. I love the... And he doesn't even play a guitar. The bass movement is like... Okay, yeah. I mean, what I noticed <laughs> was the bass line. The bass movement was like yeah. killer. It was great. Yeah, people love that acoustic queen. I I love it so much. I I knew that people would actually love it more than the real version because it's so uh, there's just something so raw about it. And the video mm-hmm. was really really special to me as well. We just did a live video of that session, and it's just me and my best friend, and we oh, nice. both have had very long days because we'd been in the studio two days straight. <laughs> Um, super exhausted. All the mm-hmm. guys are in the back eating donuts and pizza or whatever I fed them, <laughs> and. We just let we let go. It was really really special. It's fun. Nice, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what's coming next for me. I I'm I don't know Anthony. I'm terrible. <laughs> well, I'm a terrible well, musician. <laughs> you're, you're not. You are not a terrible musician. With uh, so with with so close and like that '90s vibe. Do you like tying your music to traditions? I have never thought about it that way. Do you know? I think. Sorry, go on. Do you know who Milton Babbitt was, the composer? I don't. Tell me. So he, he was like ultra modernist. He was a Princeton professor. Uh, I think he was the first professor of composition in the country. He was like big in the 70s at Princeton making like super new music. But, um, he, <laughs> quote unquote. Yeah, exactly. But he, he has this whole, uh, or he has a book called Words on Music, which uh, were a series of lectures he gave it. University of Wisconsin Madison, and they turned it into a book. But he talks about the problem that composers and music makers have: is there's sort of two modes you can fall in when talking about your music. You can do it in sort of the data side, and like this is what I do with my chord progressions, and blah 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 blah, and everybody's mm. yawning, and it's the most boring thing in the world because nobody cares what you do with your chord progressions. Or you can, except for other composers, exactly. Or you can 
try and tie your music into a tradition, but then the problem is it also then just becomes a statistic in a lineage. Ah. So did he lay out a third path, or is he condemning you to one of those two? Uh, I think that he his is like, you know, the middle way or something. The middle way? Yeah. <laughs> Nirvana. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's, that's super interesting. I love that you shared that. I wouldn't say that I tie my music to tradition. Uh -huh. I think I just do whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes it falls in line with tradition. I will say that um, I'm really, really drawn to the neo-soul genre and anything yeah. that is kind of an mm -hmm. offshoot of that. You know, this marriage of jazz and hip-hop yep. um, and R&B. And I loved neo-soul before I even knew that it existed as a genre. When I think about the songs that I loved as a kid that really stood off stood out to me off my favorite like worship album or whatever I was listening nice. to at the time as like an eight-year-old um they're they're actually very neo-soul-esque mm -hmm. and it's funny to look back and see that that I loved that before I even knew that that was its own thing uh -huh. standalone so you know late high school or early college whenever I discovered D'Angelo and Corinne Bailey Ray and mm -hmm. um uh I'm I'm blanking but now you know when I listen to Anderson Pack. Uh, Neo, these other amazing neo soul artists. Um, I I know that that was something that I've loved since I was born, and nobody right. taught me to love it. Um, I don't know what it what it even is about it that I love. I just I know that when I hear it, that's the thing that makes me want to keep listening to music. Uh -huh. I'm very I, I'm not a big fan of listening to music as a whole. I don't spend my days like with albums streaming constantly. I, get, I find it very distracting. Yeah, and most music I don't like. Anything right. that's kind of rock, no offense, <laughs> like anything that's rock inspired, I have a really, really hard time listening to. It's work for okay. me. Mm -hmm. But Neo Soul is like butter. It's water on my soul. But, but you grew up with a lot of worship music, you were saying. Not really. So my dad's a jazz head, okay. <laughs> and my brother's a jazz head as well. And my mom, uh, I guess my mom listened to a lot of worship. Mm -hmm. I, when I when I say worship albums from when I was a kid, it's not that I was constantly, you know, imbibing them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we had like the WoW 2000 CDs and, and okay. I don't know, like, these like compilation albums. And because you're using CDs, you only have a few records at a time. Right. So whatever you have, you're just listening to over and over. Right. But I, I mean, my dad was big on, you know, it was Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock, all wow. over the place. Uh, the classics, the moderns. My my brother, my brother made a list recently of all the jazz musicians that have influenced him, like either just emotionally or or in his own uh, drum and uh, and tr like trumpet stylings. Huh. And I think his list was like two hundred, three hundred people <laughs> long. Like he's the guy who knows who's drumming on that Oscar. Pe like oh great, like he knows. Yeah, he can identify the pianist. He knows the guitarist. Mm -hmm. Like oh, that's Lionel Lewicki. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's interesting about jazz is that is that weird um, coalescence of the communal nature of music, but also the sort of hyper individualism, because you have to know mm. everybody on it, and everybody's improvising and doing their own thing, but it also, I mean, comes out of super communal traditions of gospel music and blues and all. Well, I mean, I guess blues is kind of individualistic, but. Specifically, like, the gospel church traditions. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's so cohesive. Right. And there's so much there's so much love on stage between jazz mm -hmm. musicians. I love watching jazz players uh, play together. Yeah. Because they're really genuinely enjoying what the other people are doing. And they're trying, yeah. if they're good, you know, they're trying to do what's appropriate for the song. Not trying to, to show off. But in the process, they're very much showing off. <laughs> and, and they yeah. sound amazing. It's a lot yeah. of fun. It's a lot of fun. I don't know how much jazz you, you currently get to play. I don't. I don't play a lot. I don't consider myself a very good jazz jazz musician specifically. I listen to a lot of jazz, and I'm mm. very, I'm very into like uh, '60s and '70s free jazz movements and stuff like that. Mm. Like Cecil Taylor is just like maybe one of my favorite musicians of all time. Yeah, I hear that you're like the resident expert on Cecil Taylor. <laughs> You've got not the citations <laughs> and things. <laughs> well, I the it's it's because there's like ten people who have written anything mm -hmm. about him. So, but you're one of the ten. Yeah, exactly. And you have citations. You have citations, oh, yeah. Anthony. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, For, from papers I haven't even published. I just put them on my website, and it's very silly. 
It's amazing. Like you should be yeah. really proud of that. It's it's pretty fun. I I but I like his music. I just love that like the just craziness of mm-hmm. that music and uh I don't know. So would you play more of it if you could or what's stopping you? I would. Uh I'm a really slow thinker. And so oh, like, me too. bebop yeah. is just like the chords coming at me so fast. Whether or not I can do it, I'm sort of loath to practice like that. Like, I hate games yeah. that require speed. Like, I don't like spoons. I don't like any of those, like, really fast games. Egyptian rat slap, yeah. I, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I just wanna, I want something where I can think slowly and take my time. I understand that. I really, really do. Uh, I've always been super intimidated by improvisation. Uh-huh. And people would always, you know, I, I mean, I went to college for music. Right. I had one foot in the pop program, one foot in the jazz program. And I was intimidated as hell by the jazz program because having to actually improvise on, like on the spot, it's not that I can't do it and, and fake it, but anyone who's right. like a real jazz head knows that I'm just like, I'm, I'm just getting by. <laughs> I'm not thoughtfully, you know, conforming to this, this mm-hmm. E flat sus, <laughs> whatever, yep. Yep. And the way that you really should be if you're, mm-hmm. if you're trying to play off the structure of the music. It's tough. Yep. It's hard to do and it's, it's extremely hard to do well. Yes. Yeah, it is. And uh, you need a really good ear, which I think my mm-hmm. ear isn't quite good enough to hang in the the heavy bebop circles. Hmm. It's tough. Well, I yeah. I respect that you would admit that. I really do. And other <laughs> musicians would respect it too. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you might be selling your, yourself short. I would have no idea. So where's well, your sweet know. spot <laughs> with genre? Um, I don't know. You mean like, what do I like? Oh, what do you like to play? What do you feel like you're best at? Uh, I like music that is very dissonant and free and kind of has a rock vibe to it. So I like people like Mark Rebo. Uh, I love the sound of Tool and Jimi Hendrix, and I would love if Mm. those sounds were sort of let loose. Let loose. So rather than being structured songs, just use that sound world and go crazy. Got it. Just walls of sound. Isn't Tool yeah. famous for using a ton of different time signatures? Yes, yes. I like that too. Yeah. I like I like complicated time setups. But you what want a world you? where there's no time signatures at all. Just Maybe. everybody like <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that would be like. I can't be the first person to tell you that that, that sounds terrible to me <laughs> in that world. <laughs> well, part of it is how I hear music. I like to hear music gesturally. So instead of mm. I'm instead of hearing the E flat sus chord, I hear blah, 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 and that's one thing. And every time you go blah, 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 that's a thing. And then you can stack that on top of babo babo, and you can have blah, 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 and babo babo all on top of each gesturally. other. Gesturally, I like you that word. You can create word. chords out of gestures rather than notes. That's super interesting. I love the way you just framed that. And that actually <laughs> helps me understand more, I think, why you would love that uh, conglomeration of sounds. Wow. Yeah, that's really neat. I, I don't remember exactly. It's been a while since I saw you play. I saw you at Silver Lake. Mm-hmm. S- oh, yeah, when I was trying that ago. stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I don't, too- I don't recall exactly. I think there was a loop pedal involved. Yeah, that, that was a thing I was trying and... Poorly, but poorly. I don't remember it being poor, but well, I it, it was like I was trying to. I was trying to get into songwriting because I had this. I have this problem where I'm. I don't consider myself a particularly good songwriter. Hmm. But um, I never really figured out how to make that that act work. So, would you not play that kind of show today? Was that an experiment? Um. Yeah, I probably wouldn't. I would probably do some other stuff. But there's there are things that I learned that I liked about it. But yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I really respect that you went and got shows for that. I <laughs> would never, ever in a million years feel comfortable doing an experimental gig. I like to really? be super polished. Yeah, uh-huh. like if I'm oh, if I'm on stage, I'm doing the thing that I am best at doing. Uh huh. Well, you had a residency for a while, right? I did have a residency. Yeah, Republic of Pi in North Hollywood, and that was uh-huh. so good. It was so so good because I've never practiced so much. I've never practiced songs so much. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and but, but you... that but that was the thing too. Like it was, it was kind of an obsession because other mm-hmm. people who had a residency, you know, they they just 
would play through their set every week and go home and feel fine about it. But I had to make it different from last week's set. It doesn't mean adding mm-hmm. new material necessarily, but it means yep. teeing things up differently, having yeah. a little bit of different banter between songs, you know, <laughs> making making the whole experience different. Because mm-hmm. who knows, maybe some of my friends would be at the same show um, next week. Um, did, and did you I, work like, all you, that kind out of ahead a slow of time? Thinker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, a lot of it I would work out ahead of time. It was good practice letting go of something. I mean, banter, for example, I would never, I would never like write out banter. <laughs> and there was right. a time when I would have. I'll put it that way. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, like when I, I remember my first show at like seventeen or eighteen. I remember I scripted my banter and it was oh, so no. bad. <laughs> it was so bad, but that's so me. I look back, I'm like, that was definitely Alma Cook scripting her banter. <laughs> I mean, it's better to be uh, prepared than not have anything mm-hmm. to say. Oh, 100%. And I think that it, it it's a good crutch, but you don't live on crutches forever, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah, that's a um, good way Republic to put it. Was, yeah, Republic of Pie was really good for me because it, it gave me the opportunity to play some really good shows and some really bad shows and walk away feeling that's excellent okay about it yeah it was a big Mm -hmm. confidence builder but like you i think really slowly and i I feel like i have a really hard time retaining um my muscle memory for my instrument (laughs) because it's not my specialty and so i would i've kind of felt like i had to relearn stuff every week and it was very stressful Mm. so simultaneously it was extremely stressful but very very um enriching Uh uh-huh and was it just you playing? Were, were those all solo sets? Often. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm, tra- I'm trying to remember if I ever had a set with somebody else. I think I had a friend in town who maybe sang with me one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, several duets. But for the most part, yeah, just solo. It's not my preferred, obviously. Mm-hmm. Do you usually play with a band when you're touring? Do you do you get a band together? Um, Yeah, my ideal... My... Touring's a funny thing because you have overhead. <laughs> if you have five people with you, you have to house all of them and feed all of them. Right. And so you have to be mm-hmm. making enough money at a show for that to make sense. Right. So I wouldn't necessarily opt for that. If I were touring today, I would opt for a really lean yeah, crew. Yeah, of course. Maybe, maybe like a two... I have Chris, for sure, my number one. And then maybe one or two other people just to mm-hmm. get a basic rhythm section. Uh... But, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. I mean, I, I play a lot of shows now with uh, loop pedal, with pre-recorded stuff that I've done on loop. Yeah. Um, not because I can't do it live, but because it, it takes yeah. a long time to set up a loop, <laughs> as you know. And looping yeah. is a good way to fake it, you know? You may not have a drummer, but you can beatbox yeah. or tap your How do you feel about loop pedals? Do you, do you have a feeling, an emotional feeling towards uh, them? They are... From, so for some people, like if you're Ed Sheeran, the loop pedal is your craft <laughs> and you can yeah. do it masterfully. Yep. And the whole thing of you using it is you using it. Mm-hmm. The whole thing of me using it is me having a beat or me having a bass line. It's right. not me using the loop pedal. Yep. So I use it as a substitute for what I wish I had, which was personnel. Yep. Yes. It always I, impresses people, though. People love the loop pedal. Like, old ladies will come up to you and be like, oh, my goodness, look that, <laughs> what is that box? <laughs> the sound's coming out of there. <laughs> Do you find that you you start to feel tired of it, like the fifth song that you're doing a loops on and stuff? I have different performing. kinds of loops. Yeah, no, right. I, I, would, I would definitely get tired of it. So there are different kinds of loops, and I have different uh, presets saved right. for each, kinds of song, uh, each mm-hmm. kind of song that I would do. Right. I'm never going to do two of the same beat in the same set. Sure. That would get boring. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I have some vocals actually pre-saved as well from background vocals because I'm big nice. on backgrounds. Yeah. Backgrounds are like, I'm better at, at singing backgrounds than I am at singing lead. And you have that all in your loop pedal or do you run it through mm-hmm. like Ableton or something? I've got it in the loop pedal. I probably okay. could run it through a DAW, but I don't know how. Oh. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I do the bare minimum, Anthony. Bare minimum. Yeah, well, it, it's good. It makes it way easier. Overcomplicating mm-hmm. shows is a massive hassle. I think so too. Do you have uh, some horror stories with that? I I don't know about horror stories. I just think I always do it. Mm. I'm I'm always overcomplicating <laughs> my shows. So, and then there's all these. And the result these, is these... that you're stressed out, or it goes bad, or. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just focused on too many things. My problem is I set up too many things for me to focus on, and then I can't be in the moment when I'm performing. 
Which you would like to do. Yes. I need to distribute responsibility. Distribute. <laughs> so, that's so ivory tower of you. <laughs> Sorry, didn't I well, say that... about distributing responsibility on oh, stage? Oh, yeah, I should, I should do that. <laughs> cool. Well, um, so at the end of my podcast, I usually like to play some music. Um, so I don't know if uh, you have anything that you would would like me to put on it that I can play at the end. or if you I wanna... would love for you to play so close. Okay, that would be awesome. All right. So at the end of each episode, I like to either play some music that my guest has created or improvise some music with my guest. So in this case, since Alma and I were separated over uh, Zoom, playing together is a little bit difficult. So I am actually going to play a track of hers called So Close, which which is a single that she released last year. And it has a very cool 90s vibe. Yeah, I think that's that's what love is like that is yeah. like what things are. Who am I that I would push back? Is that the loving thing you made a bet for me to lie in? You know, I'm trying. See, good men they never look back, and that's a salty sting. You paved the road for me to walk on, yet I'm not gone. I'm combing through the clover for a foe leaf. Check my bag, it's over and over.
cool. Well, thanks so much for uh, for doing this. It was a fun conversation. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Let's do it again. We could talk more libertarian uh, yeah. nonsense together. <laughs> that sounds good. All right. Alma Cook, thanks so much. <laughs> thank you, Anthony. All right. Thanks for watching or listening, depending on whether you are on YouTube or listening to the stream, wherever you listen to podcasts. Please remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channels. And if you would like to support my content generally, please consider visiting my Patreon page. Bye.